So today's subject, as we start this uh, conversation about life and faith, is what about other religions? What about other religions? You see, there are, there are a whole number of, of, of questions or objections that people have to considering Jesus and who he was, who he is, what Christians claim about him. And one of the things that people object is that, well, there's so many different religions. They can't all um, be true. And faced with this choice of so many different religions, what am I supposed to think? It's a real problem and I can't think about Christianity and the idea of committing to that religion when there are so many other religions out there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Fuzz, uh, my wife, and I were at St. Catherine's Dock on Friday for, to look at all the kind of bunting being put up on the boats, and it was all looking very splendid and British um, over there. Uh, and while we were there, we made use of the really delicious lunchtime market. Who uses the St. Catherine's Dock Friday lunchtime market ever? Yeah, a few people that work that direction. So you can, just one, one day of the week, you can go to St. Catherine's Dock and they've got a beautiful kind of food market where you can get every different kind and style and culture of food uh, on offer. And uh, we went there on Friday and Fuzz and I both opted for Mother's Dumplings, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, that's my personal preference. Um, and I would say I didn't actually get around the whole rest of the market because... To be honest, I just knew that Mother's Dumplings are the nicest um, because you get this delicious roasted halloumi when, with, with a really nice kind of chilli dressing and that's kind of offset by these really nice curried cauliflowers. It's a real smorgasbord of different flavours. It's very, very tasty. Um, but there was a marketplace and you've got all these different people selling their different products and saying, no, come and try my Nigerian cooking, my curry, and somebody else is saying, no, have a good British burger. And you've got all different kinds of offerings and you're faced with this huge choice. How do you decide? And you and I live in a marketplace today. We live in a marketplace of ideas and beliefs and truth claims. And there are competing truth claims today. And there are different truth claims that come from different religions, uh, and there are others offering a distinct understanding of the world, which is, you, you might just call it a worldview, not necessarily defined, it's defining itself as a religion, but basically behaving as if it is a religion, because it has a particular framework which is all-encompassing and gives meaning to life. Um, and you might describe secularism as well as being another kind of worldview. Uh, and it states there that all religions should be kept separate from the common life and from the public uh, square. Uh, and so that in itself is a, is a, is a major worldview. And um, I was just uh, surfing the net and saw that the, the National Secular Society's tagline is challenging religious privilege. And it sort of purports to have its main goal as being the separation of, of religion and state in order that both religious and secular citizens can have their rights protected. The, the reality is, as you go through the, the website, is that it promotes a very particular worldview, which is humanism, which is a, an, an, a based on um, and accompanied by atheistic um, understandings of the world. Uh, and it really is a worldview of its own. In fact, so much so that, um, that, that, that secularism and, and globalization as well um, could be described as a religion, religion itself. Um, Brian Walsh says this about globalization. He says, it's not just an aggressive stage in the history of capitalism. It is a religious movement of previously unheard of proportions. Progress is its underlying myth. Unlimited economic growth is its foundational faith. The shopping mall, physical or online, is its place of worship. Consumerism is its overriding image. I'll have a Big Mac and fries is its ritual of initiation. And global domination is its ultimate goal. Globalization and secular humanism is a religion of its own, whether it would like to think so or not, because of the claims that it makes. And so we're surrounded by this marketplace of ideas, one of which is, is, uh, is secularism, and there are these other religions and different philosophies. And how do you choose? How do you choose your beliefs and convictions? 
in any marketplace, it's sensible to kind of weigh up the options, to weigh up what's, what's uh, on offer before you decide to buy. If I'd just gone straight to Mother's Dumplings and said, I'm just going to have what you've got, and hadn't contrasted it on Friday with the other kind of offerings that there were, how would I know that I'd made the best choice? How would I know? There was so much on offer, the right thing to do was to shop around a bit until I'd found something that would truly satisfy. And in the same way, in in the marketplace of ideas, you have to weigh up the strength of competing claims that you're surrounded by. It's just not an option in the world that we live in to unthinkingly carry on uh, with your beliefs and attitudes because that's just what they are. Because we live in an unavoidably, uh, um, we're confronted unavoidably by these opposing beliefs and contrary beliefs. And our context here in East London is, is a fascinating one, isn't it? We, we are in a place of amazing diversity. We experience cultural and, and, and ethnic diversity, social diversity, and uh, the diversity of beliefs. What I mean by that is that you probably live next door to somebody who makes sense of the world in a radically different way to the way that you do. They probably have a different framework for looking at the world and they come to different conclusions about what the meaning of the world is and what their place in it is to that which you hold. And that is a huge thing. That's a huge change that's taken place in just a few years. Um, if, if we'd lived 200 years ago, that might, that might sound like a long time, but in the, in the sweep of, um, of humanity and history, it's not very long a time. If we'd been born in Britain 200 years ago, you and I would have lived in a place where we would have shared the same basic view of the world to our neighbour. So you would have had a similar way of looking at the world. You'd have had a a similar understanding of what your place in the world was and what the ultimate meaning of your life was because it was framed by a culture that was uniform. Okay, there were were differences perhaps between um, people that were advancing in certain sciences in one direction and uh, and other kind of philosophies. But in in essence, as a culture, you'd have been surrounded and, and living amongst people who shared the same basic assumptions about the world as you. And that's no longer true. That's no longer true. We live in a marketplace of ideas and beliefs. And we could think about why that's the case. We could think about why it's true that, that we are surrounded by such a kind of a melting pot of different beliefs today. It's probably more than anything else to do with communications revolution, isn't it? The fact that the world is a far smaller place and there's a growing movement of people around the world who bring different worldviews with them. And that's transformed uh, this world that we live in into this marketplace. And so the question for us is, how do we engage with that new reality? If you're a Christian here today, how do you engage with the fact that there are competing truth claims and worldviews to your own? And if you're here as a a guest or as somebody who's inquiring about the Christian faith or um, frankly objects to it and you want to engage with the conversation, how do you engage with the marketplace of ideas? And so over the coming weeks, we want to enable a conversation about life and faith because we believe that's the best way to invite you and to uh, invite your friends to engage with the Christian understanding of the way that the world is, what the meaning and the purpose of your life is, and how you can truly have life in all its fullness. It's the presence of the marketplace of ideas that makes you and I ask, what about other religions? What about them? When we're thinking about the Christian faith. And religion can be very polarizing, can't it? People say that, you know, that's just one of the two major things, politics and religion. Just don't talk about those things when you're at a dinner party. It's like the way to kind of kill a thing. Religion is polarizing today. Um, especially in our culture in, in Britain today. It's becoming more 
it, well, the country is becoming both more religious and more secular at the same time. The subject of religion is therefore very contentious because you've got religion on the one hand being kind of talked about in a way that, it, that says it has to be privatised, it has no place in the public sphere, and you've got views of people like Richard Dawkins with a kind of aggressive atheism who are saying, putting a case very forcefully for saying religion is bad. Religion is bad for the world, and it should be contested, and it should be uh, uh, sort of wiped out as, as much as it possibly can be. And he puts that case very, very uh, forcefully in his book, the, the God Delusion. And then meanwhile, on the other hand, you've got religion that's becoming an ever bigger part of the reality that we live in, of the world that we live in. The Western sociologists that maybe just 20 or 30 years ago would have thought that globalization and modernization would have been accompanied by increasing secularization across the whole world and that religion would be far less of an important factor in, in life as we became more modernized and more globalized. And they have been proved utterly wrong. And you'll find very few sociologists today who feel that religion is going to dwindle and become less of an issue. In fact, they'd say the opposite. It's one of the big issues in the world that we live in, this multiplicity of religions. And the fact that religion seems to be gaining um, importance in, in life. And that means that we've got this kind of tension going on in culture between uh, the fact that there are people who want to say, let's get rid of religion, and if we can't get rid of it, let's just privatise it and say you, you can't bring it into your relationships with other people. And you've got other people who are saying, my religion is very important for me, it forms who I am, and it's the way that I look at the world. And what do we do with that fact? It means we have to think it through. And that's what I'd love us to do just for a few minutes this morning. And as we do so, I'd like to uh, turn to um, a little bit of, of scripture in John's Gospel. And uh, Jesus has been uh, engaging for some time with the religious leaders of his day who were Jewish religious leaders, and particularly with the Pharisees, who are some of the most um, religiously minded people within, uh, within culture. They would be people who took their faith extremely seriously, who wanted to apply it to every single area of their life, and who had a, a, a kind of a religi religious conviction for every single thing that they did, and they didn't get on very well with Jesus. And we'll find out why that's the case um, in the passage that we read um, here. So in John chapter 5, we find that uh, in verse 16, because Jesus was doing these things, these things that he was doing, by the way, was he was healing people and he was making them well again. And he was doing it any day of the week, including on Sundays. Uh, uh, sorry, on Saturdays, the Sabbath, including doing it on, on the Sabbath. And for some people, for the Pharisees, that was a big issue because healing people, if you're a healer, is work and therefore you shouldn't be doing it on the Sabbath. So um, they had a big problem with this. And because Jesus was doing these things, healing on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him and they come, towards, they come to him and they have a great big kind of they, they're, trying to, they're trying to pick a fight with him. And Jesus, in response, says a number of things. But what I'd love for us to look at very, um, very closely this, this morning is what Jesus says on the next page, if you're, on, if you're in the, the Church Bibles on page 1010. And um, in verse 37 where Jesus says this, the father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. And then Jesus says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you possess eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. These, Jesus says, are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. 
So Jesus is talking to the most religious people of his day. And what he says to them is, you are missing the point of your faith. He says to them, you, are, you have turned uh, your faith into a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts. You're trying to be right before God because of the things that you do. And you don't realize that all of it points to me. Jesus is saying, it's about me. It's about a relationship with me. It's about what the scriptures say about me. And because you refuse to come to me, you don't ultimately get life. You don't get the very thing that these scriptures are all about. These, of course, are the Jewish scriptures that the Pharisees would have taken so seriously. And Jesus says, these scriptures point towards me, and yet you do not come to me to have life. And in this, we see that there is a fundamental difference and a uniqueness about Jesus and about people who believe in him that sets it apart, that sets him apart from all others in history and sets the Christian faith apart from all other religions in a fundamental way. What we get here in in a snapshot is the contrast between religion and Jesus and trusting in Jesus. What, would you, what Jesus is saying is that you're trying to merit your own salvation. You're, tr- you're diligently studying reli- the, the religious um, faith. And you're trying to put it into practice in your own strength. And you don't realize that it's all about me. And so you don't get me. You don't come to me to have life. And so to say those two things clearly again, first of all, Jesus is unique. Jesus uniquely offers something that we all need. And secondly, therefore, and flowing out of that first claim, faith in Jesus, the Christian faith, is unique. It speaks in a different way to all other worldviews and ways of making sense of the world and religions. And so, just to make it absolutely clear, to put my cards on the table, it won't surprise you to learn that I am a believer in Jesus Christ, that that, that means for me that, that, that I understand it and have com- become convinced that Jesus of Nazareth uh, was God incarnate. He was the one and only God-man, the divine in human form. He was fully God and fully man, at one and the same time, and he still is. But let's look a little bit more at the uniqueness of Jesus that we find here. And you see, John is all the way through saying some things about Jesus. And and Jesus says in, in this Gospel of John about how unique he is and about what he uniquely offers. And so right from the beginning, uh, Jesus is saying you get life if you come to me. And if we just trace it from the beginning of the gospel, we find in, in the very first chapter, in verse four of chapter one, we find, we find it said that in Jesus was life. And that life was the light of all people. In Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all people. So Jesus can, it is the source of light, and Jesus offers us the light of life. And so throughout, whenever Jesus is having an encounter with somebody, he doesn't offer them a new way to get to God, a new way to please God, a new way to be righteous before God. What he actually offers them is himself. He offers them himself, he offers them life. So when he's speaking to the Samaritan woman in chapter 4 of John's Gospel, He says to her in verse 14, those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Come to me and you'll get living water that will well up with inside you and lead to eternal life. A little bit later on in John's Gospel in chapter 6, Jesus describes himself in a new way to a whole bunch of people who've come looking for the next meal, come looking for the next little kind of 
way of being satisfied. And Jesus speaks to them in, 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 in this way. He says to them in chapter 6 and verse 33, the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they say, wow, please can we have that bread? That sounds brilliant. And in verse 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. Jesus says, if you come to me, then you will be satisfied. You will get life if you come to me. Later on, Jesus describes himself as the one who has come to bring life in all its fullness. In chapter 10, I have come that they may have life and life in all its fullness, life to the full. That's the reason that Jesus came, was to bring life, not to bring a new methodology, a new way of pleasing God. No, Jesus came to show us that we need life and that he alone can offer it. And so finally, when John is wrapping up his, um, his account of the life of Jesus, his witness to what Jesus has done, he explains why he's written these things down, the things that Jesus did and said. And he says in John chapter 20 and verse 31, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That by believing you may have life in his name. So only Jesus offers life. Only Jesus offers life. And only Jesus says, come to me to have life. And that is something that sets him apart from all other religious leaders throughout history. In contrast to the founders of, of, of other you know, great world religions, only Jesus claimed to be salvation. So you great religious leaders like, uh, think of Muhammad in Islam and, uh, and um, Gautama Buddha for Buddhism and Confucius in Chinese philosophy. And you could think of uh, people like Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism. They all say... I'm going to show you the way to God. And it's that. It's doing this. Like, maybe copy me, do the things I did, imitate me, and then you will come to God, or you will, become, you will come to your ultimate purpose and reality. Jesus doesn't say anything like that. He says, if you want to get to God, come to me. Come to me. If you want to see God, Jesus says, look at me. Only Jesus offers life in himself. And so he is unique. And because Jesus is unique, the Christian faith is also unique. The Christian faith is not about a list of do's and don'ts, uh, a way of being, becoming righteous. The Christian faith is a response to a gift. And that means that, in a funny way, um, religion is talked about in quite strange terms in the Bible. And so there's very few references to religion in the Bible. And where they come, they tend to be slightly kind of ambivalent about, about what, they're, what they're talking about. So religion is, is the word that's translated from a few different things in the letter of James. Um, James is saying, if anyone considers himself religious... And yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. And what, Jesus, uh, what James is, there, is saying is he's using a word which is, which is threskeia. And the word, Greek word threskeia, which is, which is translated as religion, that word means ceremonial observance. And it means especially very demonstrative worship. You know, so um, it, it means to kind of, to really be effusive, to really be kind of speaking out loudly and almost kind of clamoring um, your praise to God. And James is saying, so if, if you're into kind of religion in terms of being really effusive and being really slightly kind of bombastic in, your, in, in the way that you praise, then just be careful that you're keeping a tight rein on your tongue. Be careful that your religion isn't, isn't just about self 
aggrandizement isn't just about kind of um, for, the, for the benefit of people around you. Be very careful about the way that you use your tongue. Don't just kind of um, praise God in these amazing ways in one sense and then turn around and, and, and kind of be spiteful and use your tongue to be, to be hurtful towards others in the next breath. You have to be careful about the way that you um, act. So James isn't really talking about religion in that particular instance. There's another one, which is another word which is translated as religion in, in the New Testament, uh, and that is a word Eusebio in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, and there, um, Paul is saying to Timothy, uh, if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents. This is pleasing to God. The word uh, translated there as religion, Eusebio, is, is piety. Piety towards God or piety towards others. Not necessarily what we would think of religion as being, which is this kind of monolithic way of, uh, of, of, of life. You know, these, this, this kind of um, rules of how to please God and be, and be righteous and get to heaven. That's not actually what Paul's talking about. He's talking about godliness. And then another word which is, which is translated as, as religion, uh, the, the last of them, is um, a word, the Greek word, deisidemonia. Hang on a minute. Deisidemonia. Okay. Uh, and that is a word which basically means superstition or controversy, that kind of a word. And so Paul uses that word to describe the religious people of Athens when he goes to Athens to have a big conversation with them about Jesus. And he says, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, as in very superstitious, very much into kind of different ideas uh, and, and different kind of controversies about how you can be spiritual. And again, that's not a particularly kind of attractive um, notion for religion. And so basically the Bible doesn't think of religion as being a particularly good thing. It gets a pretty bad, bad rep. Uh, and really that's because the Bible, because it all points to Jesus, is all about a person and it's about a relationship. It's not about a set of rules and do's and don'ts that will get you to heaven if you keep them. And therefore, that means that we see what I describe as clear blue water emerging between um, a religious worldview on one hand and what I might call a worldview that's formed by Jesus uh, on, the, on the other hand and by the teachings of Jesus. At the end of the day, you can boil it down to the difference between um, being right in your own strength and because you're observing the right rules, and being right because God has made you right. Because you've received a gift from, from God. And that's really why the gospel is described in, as it is. Why Jesus is described as good news. That's what gospel means. The basic difference between religion and gospel is that religion is, is what you do. The gospel is the good news of what Jesus has done. And that means that you know, at the heart of the Christian faith is a fundamental difference. At the heart of the Christian faith is the reality that a man died for his enemies. Praying for them and praying for their forgiveness. That man was also God, dying for his enemies, enabling their forgiveness, bringing about their forgiveness. And Tim Keller, who wrote The Reason for God, which is a, a kind of a great book to accompany our series over the coming weeks, I'd really uh, endorse it to you. It's Pretty good value if you buy it online. Um, probably shouldn't plug the, the where to buy it from, but you know, you can find it pretty cheap. Um, Tim Keller says uh, this when he when he talks about the way he moved from understanding Christian faith as being a religion to understanding it being a gift from God. 
a grace, a gift, and, and the gospel. And, and he says this, when my own personal grasp of the gospel was very weak, my self-view swung wildly between two poles. When I was performing up to my standards in academic work, professional achievement, or relationships, I felt confident, but not humble. I was likely to be proud and unsympathetic to failing people. When I was not living up to standards, I felt humble, but not confident, a failure. I discovered, however, that the gospel contained the resources to build a unique identity. In Christ, I could know I was accepted by grace, not only despite my flaws, but because I was willing to admit them. The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me, yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. This is what sets the Christian faith apart as totally unique. It is because of the uniqueness of Jesus and what he has done for us. Rick, you're going to help us to move into a dialogue about the subject. Yeah. So <clears throat> before we do that, we're going to set up the stage a little bit for some, uh, a little panel. What I'd love you to do is just... Okay, um, we're going to have a mixture of um, live questions and questions that have come up um, on, uh, on Twitter and um, by text. So we'll start with a couple of um, electronic questions which have come up from you, which have been um, uh, tweeted. So the first one coming up, I haven't seen this. Okay, chaps, that's where it is. So um, by the way, the, the panels are not always going to be all men. Just so you know, that's okay. So, um, isn't claiming exclusivity arrogant? How can you talk about the uniqueness of Jesus without sounding arrogant? So there are two things there. Isn't claiming exclusivity arrogant? And how can you talk about the uniqueness of Jesus without sounding arrogant? So, um, Jude, why don't you kick that off? Great, Rick. Thank you. First question. The, um, I mean, humility clearly is always a, a challenge, I think, in whatever kind of sphere we're talking about. And, and, and I know for myself, as someone who got a lot of kind of um, non-Christian friends, I mean, I'm always looking to kind of learn from, from micro non-Christian friends as we kind of talk about stuff. But I think, um, I, I think the question about uh, exclusivity being arrogant, I mean, I... I don't think that makes a lot of sense, really, because if you if you look closely at the different uh, you know different faiths, I've got a number of friends who are kind of Muslims up in uh, up in Watney Market. Actually, you know, we do believe you know quite different things. Um, you know, you know the, the kind of Muslim worldview, uh, the type of God that they worship, the expectations of how God is going to be at work in their lives are very different. Um, and we make exclusive claims as Christians, um, and so I. I think I'm kind of optimistic, really, that there's a kind of new, a new kind of harmony emerging where we can, we can say with confidence, actually, as a Christian, I believe something, um, you know, very specific about who Jesus is. Um, and to do that in a way that kind of honors uh, Christianity, I'm willing to hear other people's exclusive claims. Um, but I don't think, I think arrogancy kind of misses the, you know, kind of undermines, actually, the exclusivity of, of all religions to a degree. Every religion is saying something different. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's arrogant. Okay, fantastic. I would add as, as well about that is the building on what Jude was saying, which is the, the fact that different religions all make exclusive claims uh, and they're competing claims. Uh, then I suppose the person who has a problem with the exclusivity of, of the Christian faith probably has a problem with the exclusivity of other faiths as well, um, which means that they might be an agnostic or an atheist. Um, and that means they've probably got fairly exclusive views as well of their own, uh, even if it's the kind of the absolute view that, that, that there are no exclusive, that there can be no ex exclusive claims to truth. Um, you know, that's a pretty um, forceful statement. So it, 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 I think it's the kind of view that comes from somebody that doesn't want to necessarily, you know, that wants to have their cake and eat it a little bit. Um, and uh, in re re regard to the, to the second one, Again, I think it's the, the truth of, of what Jesus, if, if you kind of face up to what Jesus is 
done and who he is and what he went through in order for us to have life, then um, it's actually so humbling that um, it really ought to propel us into the kind of life that John was, was, was talking about with, that, that we saw in Paul, a life where he just he wanted to offer people Jesus because it changed his life. And therefore, you know, if we understand and appreciate um, what Jesus has done, it, it can only lead us to a desire to share that, but also in, in a humble way, which says, he did it for me, and that meant that I needed it, um, and that's pretty humbling. So it, I think it's the very essence of what um, the Christian faith is and says that kind of challenges us and should prevent us from arrogance. Okay, let's have the next question. Um, how do you explain the significant similarities between the three largest world religions? How do you explain the significant similarities between the three largest world religions? Uh, Ed, why don't you start? Are they that similar? I don't know. I mean, well, what if, are you talking about numerically, like as in probably Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. Hinduism? No, Buddhism. Buddhism? Buddhism. Or is it the monotheistic faiths, the, 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 the three major monotheistic faiths of Judaism and Islam and Christianity? Because they're quite different. Okay, why don't we start with either of those, either or both of those, and just John, take us through the. <laughs> we, okay, what we're looking for here is not kind of long and deep. Uh, well, we want one deep, but not long answers. So we want short, kind of pithy. What is a kind of a, a, just an immediate response to this? Well, let me just say this: the three great. Um, I think Ed talked about it. The three biggest religions are not similar. Um, the three religions that are similar, similar because they all derive from the experience of God with Abraham are uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. So I know you want to keep this short, but I'm just... Yeah. So, so I think the, for starters, the, three big, you know, the, the third biggest religion is Buddhism, and it is not similar yeah. to Christianity okay. or Islam. I think you've effectively answered the, f the question as well. In, in, Mon, you know, is the Abrahamic faith, so right. they come from a similar place. Do you want to add anything to that? And, and just in relation to the essential distinctions between those monotheistic faiths, it's, it really comes down to the conviction for a, for a Christian that, that, that a, a Jew has missed the coming of the Messiah, and it's, they, they didn't recognize it when it happened, and that a, a Muslim has rejected the coming of the Messiah and has turned away from that, uh, from, from Jesus at coming as Messiah. So it, the, essence, the essential difference comes to the way that both, you know, a Jewish person or, on the other hand, a Muslim person treats the person of Jesus. And, and there will be many similarities because of those um, underlying kind of common her, um, history but the essential difference, which makes all of the difference, is to do with what does that person do, the Jewish person or the, or the Muslim do, with who Jesus is. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just take one live question before going to um, another electronic one. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just a question about Jesus. I, I guess one of the things I'd ask is, you know, can a man's actions for 33 years, well, actually not even 33 years, because the, the actual physical f thing that you see died and rose again, shaped the universe, the cosmos, and uh, eternal eternity. It's a very simple thing for people to grasp when we're in this world of science, technology, iPads. This one fact that he died in a few days and rose again shapes everything. So the question is, so how, how do we make sense of the significance of that, even though it's such a small kind of space of time? Well, I mean, goodness, John, a, you know, a huge question. Um, but, um, I, I, I mean, maybe in simple terms, the, you know, all the Abrahamic faiths that we've talked about all recognize that there is something wrong with the world. There is something broken about the human condition, about we see it in extreme forms, in wars and suffering. and um, there is, There's evil at work in the world. There is brokenness. And, and there's a sense in which we all carry that. If we all kind of you know, are honest with ourselves and kind of look in the mirror, actually, my goodness, we're all broken vessels. We're not the people we could be. 
And I think all the Abrahamic faiths agree on that, agree with this kind of sense of brokenness within the world. There's evil has come in. And um, to kind of focus on one element of Jesus' ministry, which is, you know, the, the, the pinnacle, if you like, of his ministry, his, his death on the cross and then his resurrection to new life. The kind of mainstream Christian understanding is that, is that at that point, when Jesus gave his life on the cross, he was dealing fundamentally with the brokenness of the human condition. That, um, you know, all the kind of uh, the wrongdoing, the way we're all caught up with this kind of, this kind of cosmic rebellion of evil, we're all kind of caught up with that. And actually on the cross, Jesus is dealing with that at the most fundamental level. He's paying the price, if you like, that we couldn't pay. He's dying the death that in some ways as, as, as rebels again, against God, we all deserve. And, and then by rising to a new life, he's kind of breaking the, the forces of death and evil and then inviting us into this kind of new life. And so whilst, whilst you're right, on one level it's kind of it's impossible to kind of understand how this moment could be the hinge moment of all of human history. You know, actually this, I guess the, you know, the mainstream Christian understanding is that something was going on at that point where God himself was dealing with evil and brokenness and, and creating a way in which mankind, humanity, can come back into a relationship with him. So I guess that's the, that's the kind of core. And, and, you know, I think we see, you know, we see, we have testimony and we see resonance and we see that working itself out in the life of the church and, um, yeah, throughout history. Okay. Thank you. Um, one more question. Andrew, there's one on more that's come through. Is postmodernism a threat or an opportunity to Christianity? <laughs> Is postmodernism a threat or an opportunity to Christianity? So you might like to say what postmodernism is. For, um, help, ooh, help people oh, understand. Oh, oh, oh. Go uh, ahead. I was reading about this the other day. Um, He's done his homework. <laughs> we'll make this the last question just for there was time. A, there was a philosopher bloke, Leotard. Um, Leotard? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And uh, he, he, he's given probably the most pithy um, definition of postmodernism, which is that it is a, sus a suspicion of meta-narratives. <laughs> That's is really the... helpful. Thank you. Okay? <laughs> is that okay? So it, what, it, what it says is, is... Well, no, it makes a lot of sense, actually. What it basically says is um, a postmodern outlook on life is basically one which is sceptical to anything which ha makes ultimate claims about the way that the world is, or has a way of describing and explaining the whole world and where you fit into it. And so um, postmodernism is this very is a strange kind of self-contradictory um, thing, which is really more to do with the unraveling of a modernist outlook on life, which was very kind of defined, and, uh, and we, we sp spoke about progress and the fact that that we would what we kind of arrive at this a secular world that was that was um, where everything was just getting better all the time. There was the kind of expectations of modernism, which derived from this enlightenment understanding of the progress of humans. And postmodernism is saying, well, that's kind of seems to be falling apart. But that could be creative. That could be interesting because it means that we can look at these different viewpoints and and begin to synthesise them or begin to offset them. So that's kind of what I, what kind of my take on what postmodernism is. But hey, what's yours? Um, and. Um, <laughs> Uh, but th this is kind of this is it a threat or is, an opportunity? It's both. It's, yeah, it's both. As in, as any kind of um, prevailing kind of cultural current uh, is. Um, uh, yeah. John. Can I add something to that? Um, we've talked a lot about how uh, Shadwell is the poorest ward in the UK in terms of child poverty at 61 um, percent. Our our whole team has really been doing some digging on this, and we we discovered that. The area around the DLR station is in the top or at the bottom 1% of the UK in terms of poverty. Now, here's where I'm going with the postmodernism. Um, on the other hand, that same area is in the top 1% of services and finance going to that level of poverty. There's an essential mismatch there between the services that are served up in a modern framework, so through programs or blunt instruments and, you know, in that, in that way. So there's um, all that to say there's, there's just a real misfire between all this money 
and attention that's going to the poorest in the UK and it's not hitting the mark. What I think postmodernism do does is it deconstructs that modern worldview that says bigger is better, that responses should be corporate, that we should create a program, and has become much more relational, um, which I think we've all found is the missing, the missing ingredient on the ground around us is that, that, that poverty and dependency really will only be unlocked when you go relationally to your neighbor. Jude, do you want to add anything next? Well, that's really helpful. I think, um, first of all, let's give the panel a little clap. <laughs> so, on the spot, they didn't know what was coming. What this, I want to kind of frame the next few weeks, really, by saying we're going to try doing, developing this idea of this kind of conversation. Some will be through text. So probably the easiest thing, we might, um, if you've got any ideas about making this better as a process, we might kind of write down questions so that we can kind of um, pull uh, different groups of questions together. But um, we'll kind of be doing that over the next few weeks, hopefully kind of getting it better and better. The, um, these, these are open, these um, hashtags and um, that text number. So if you've got questions, um, for next week, which is about suffering. Um, uh, I will be doing that, and we'd love your questions about that to explore. Um, and this is a great place.